Well, welcome, brothers and sisters. Sorry I can't be here with you this morning. I, I remembered only recently that I made a promise to a brother uh, who's running another church uh, in Doonside, and he needed to go on holidays. He's only got a small church there, so he doesn't have any other preachers. So a few of us have filled in for him. Uh, so I've recorded this, and it's, it's great, therefore, that the technology for today offers us the ability to be in two places at the one time. So, look, I hope you enjoy the talk today. Uh, we're kind of at the second last of our series on Nehemiah, the restoration of the wall. Uh, but I hope you've been seeing too over the weeks that the restoration is is primarily more about the people of God being restored. And so the, the wall is, is really just a, a metaphor uh, of what's happening in the hearts of the people. And so Nehemiah brings this kind of idea called the joy of the Lord. Uh, chapter 8, verse 10, he says, be strengthened in the joy of the Lord. And so somehow, it's it's this is what Nehemiah brings, this uh, personal, deep-rooted, um, transforming joy of knowing God. Um, and that's what's going to transform the people. So, oh, so I hope you've uh, sort of resonated with that over the last few weeks. This week is a, is a funny kind of summary because it's talking more about the fear of the Lord and how the fear of the Lord is connected with gaining a deep joy in God. So so I'll be talking about how those two ideas work together. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 5. Uh, so let me pray for us and then we'll uh, get stuck into this uh, talk. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word and your spirit. Uh, Lord, please be with us this morning. Open our hearts uh, and open our hearts to see that um, in our obedience to you, uh, that obedience is not um, a terrible thing, but just a, a great uh, segue into understanding a deep, deep, deep joy. And uh, please give us uh, hearts that are open today, minds that would listen uh, and a will uh, to apply. Uh, so be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the ocean can be such an inspiring and awesome place to be. Uh, it's so powerful. And, and, you know, yet many a sailor has been taken by the ocean, hasn't it? Because they haven't had a healthy fear of the ocean. They made a, a, a calculated error uh, in not fearing the ocean enough. They haven't reverenced the ocean or respected its destructive power. Uh, so they just didn't fear the ocean enough. And yet, on the other hand, a healthy fear of the ocean, once you understand the power of the ocean, it can bring such a, a deep, supreme joy. You know, when you prepare to check the weather uh, patterns and, and pick the right day to go out, get your boat ready, um, and you're fully prepared when the swell is down, when the sun is shining, when there's no wind, what, you know, what a magical day that is. And how good is the experience? Something so powerful something so potentially destructive and overwhelming on one hand can also bring such a joy of experience. Now, the ocean is something you should fear, brothers and sisters, so that you can learn how to get the most joy out of it. But as a brother reminded me this week, the ocean is really an element. It's, it's hard to compare that with our great God. Uh, but brothers and sisters, the idea is kind of the same. How much more Ought we to have a fearful reverence or a respect for our great God, who is on one hand the supreme judge of the world, right? And on the other, he can bring such a deep and boundless joy to our hearts as we live in obedience to him. Now somehow Nehemiah understands that living his life in the fear of the Lord leads to this deep understanding so he can make that proclamation there in chapter 8 verse 10. Nehemiah knows that the deeper you go in obedience because of your fear of God, the fuller your joy in the Lord. And that, that's what I'm hoping that we'll be able to glean out of this section. And so that question, I think we've already kind of raised out of this, is what makes Nehemiah so different to the other leaders? Uh, what mo motivates him to live so differently but with honesty, with integrity, with justice? Uh, and the answer is that, you know, as, as with his servants around him, they live in the fear of the Lord, a healthy fear of the Lord. He is an awesome and gracious and loving God, but he is also righteous and just. He doesn't tolerate sin and ungodliness. 
And there, on one hand, there are consequences for those who reject God, aren't there? There's judgment and death. This is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says himself. For those who reject God and, and refuse to bow under him. And, and on the other hand, there are consequences also for the people of God who have taken him for granted and disobey him, such as in the case of the Israelites in this context, in this part of history. Where they are is, is related to their relationship with God, as we will see. But this healthy fear, um, please let me stress this, does not result in fearful living. A healthy fear of God does not result in fearful living, but liberated truth living, uh, which is embedded in the knowledge of the goodness of God. So the real outcome of how we should live, huh, I think it's this kind of idea, obedience always gives way to joy. Obedience to God, to God always gives way to joy. And that's what we'll look at today. So the great contrast between God's people who live in fear of God, in the fear of the Lord, including those who call themselves gods, and then, and then there are um, those people who just do not fear the Lord. And so the problem Nehemiah tackles at its core is really a, a work of the heart upon God's people. It's an inside-out restoration. Nehemiah knows that walking in the fear of the Lord will bring significant changes. And that's uh, the other thing we'll look at here. What 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 are the changes that uh, restore the people to God? Uh, firstly, I've got to say the first thing uh, the walking in the fear of the Lord brings is better circumstances. Um, you look at verse 9 there. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good, says Nehemiah. Ought you not to walk in the fear of, the, of God to prevent the taunts of the nations? And so the reason why God's people are in this mess in the first place, Nehemiah says, is because they do not fear God. Yeah, that's the implication of the verse. Their demise or their downfall as a nation and the humiliation it has brought comes because they have taken their eyes off God in the first place. And so I think there's a correlation there where, where, where we are in our circumstances is often a reflection of where we are with God. Now, what I, what I mean by that is uh, it, no matter what our circumstances are around us, uh, our the way we feel or our demeanour within those circumstances is primarily more affected by our relation where we, where we are with God. So just to, to give you an example, for instance, you know you can be having the worst day of the week or the worst week of the year or the worst year and you still have a level of joy in your heart about it. Or the opposite, uh, you can have everything falling into place in your life and really you've got it all, you, you, you know, you've, made a success of your career, you've got a level of wealth, and you can still feel empty and unfulfilled, brothers and sisters. And that's because of where God is in your life. Where is God in your life at the moment? Because a reverent fear is not about being fearful of God. You know, um, It's more like the, the powerful ocean. It's about having an acute awareness of his movements, being sensitive to where he is in your life. I'm not scared of the ocean. I don't fear the ocean. I love the ocean. But I need to, to be very careful and, and about its movements, especially when I'm about to jump in. Where is God in your life? How much time do you consider his movements in your life? Uh, because that's going to impact the circumstances. The people of God have taken their eyes off God. Uh, and really they shattered the environment around them, the circumstances are bad, but their, their heart, their senses, their, their demeanour, their, their morally brought down, they're humiliated. So it is, it's affected the, them circumstantially. Number two, for walking in the fear of the Lord restores justice, which in turn actually restores relationships. So, you know, the relationships in Judah at that time are so corrupted. In verses 1 to 5, you've got the nobles 
on, on the one hand, those who have um, the wealth and the power, and then you've got the people on the ground just trying to make a living, trying to survive. And so those two relationships are corrupted. You've got there in verses 1 and 2, you've got suppression and starvation because of this inequality. Um, you've got loss of land in verse 3, and then you've got the debt and people actually putting their own sons and daughters into slavery on the other. And so the leaders of the people of God are treating their own brothers and sisters as slaves. It's just like Egypt all over again when God's people were crying out under the slavery of the Egyptians, except this time it's at the hands of of their own people. And Nehemiah stands up for this. He speaks into it with justice. He brings them to account. Now, verses six, uh, from verse 6 there, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to do with them, and, and I said, as far as possible, we had brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles, and now you're selling them. In other words, you know, we tried our hardest to bring our people back, and then you're selling them back into slavery, so we have to buy them back again. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? And, and so he brings them to, to, to account, account for what they've done. And in verses 12 and 13, the, the leaders are restored, and that, and that in turn restores um, the people, and they can all say amen together in, in praise to God. So verse 12, they give it back. They won't demand anything from their brothers. Then he makes the nobles and the priests, he brings them together and the officials and makes them take an oath and make a promise that they will restore things. And then, uh, you know, so, so he restores them back. We, brothers and sisters, must be a people of justice as well. Living in the fear of the Lord means we speak with justice. We won't be scared to call out injustices. We'll advocate for the poor and for the suppressed. Those who right now are being unfairly dealt with, we'll have a conscience about it because we're being made accountable by God. That's one of the qualities that separates us from the rest of the world. You know, the need... I realise is overwhelming. Just being in Zimbabwe for two two weeks, people wanting asking me to help them get out of the country, asking me for money so they can pay for things, asking for things that they can use for their work. They, they're just so destitute and desperate. And we cannot save everyone, but we must be thinking about how we can make a difference. The Kura project I started is to make it so we can make a difference, so we can give them some money to start seeding programs so they can create projects and become self-sufficient. And that's that's how we can help our brothers and sisters there because of the injustice that they're under. Uh, I also want to start a, a counselling, financial counselling arm next year in Penrith so that we can help people here as well. It's so important for them to see that we want to help them and the justice of God to see equality uh, and, and an equitable outcome for everyone drives us to want to help our community, brothers and sisters, so that our consciences can alert us to these things. Pray that we get necessary funding. Pray that we get volunteers and begin to make a difference in our community. Thirdly, living in the fear of the Lord brings accountability to the individual and, and it, 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 it's seen in, in integrity uh, as well. I want you to see Nehemiah is a great leader. So he's a great leader because he has integrity. But that's because, in the first instance, he is a man of God. His actions are primarily about how he can serve God. But it also then, it, you see how it gives form and shape to his leadership and to his integrity. And people want to follow him because he shows these forms and shapes of integrity. And you see there in verses 14 to, to, to 19, the focus now is on him as the leader and how he sacrifices of his own a time, his own treasures, his own talents to help these people. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes when I was appointed, this is 12 years, he never ate any of the food that was allotted to him, that he was deserving of as a governor, okay? and the, which those who preceded him took, and all the silver they took, and, and all even their assistance that they took. But there it is there. There's a tag, verse 15b. Out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. 
Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. Uh, all my men were assembled. And then he talks about the fact that he had to feed 150 people at the table each time as well. And so the demand that they placed on him. And this was because of the demands were heavy on his people. Um, when you live in the fear of the Lord, guys, God speaks to you in these, in these uh, contexts. I mean, I was greatly convicted in my heart when uh, only, you know, in the last year or so that, you know, our finances weren't, weren't going very well and it was creating a burden on our church and that I had to do something about it. Um, and we all, if we're sensitive and conscious to the word, word of God in our hearts, if we, if we live by integrity, if we live in the fear of the Lord, we will be shaped by him and we will be made accountable by him and then we will act and obey him in that integrity and honesty and the desire to be just in our actions. Yeah, I, I, I want you to uh, make a promise, brothers and sisters. I, I'd, I'd like you to be sensitive to the prompting of God in your life. I want to ask you a question to make a promise in that one of three, just one of three areas of, of your life in your time in your talents, in your treasures, just as Nehemiah did when he was convicted and challenged by God. Uh, in, your, in your area of time, uh, I want you to make a promise if there is a, a situation where you, you just let, the, let God down, I want you to fix something that needs fixing in your life, in your, the area of your, of your time. Maybe it's your quiet time with God. Uh, in our, our Wednesday group, we've, we've decided to make each other accountable uh, in certain areas. That's a great thing to do. Uh, maybe you just have stopped praying to God because you put other things first. Uh, in the fear of the Lord, place your time, make a priority of your time to God. Secondly, in your talents. Um, you know, there, there are ministries. God has, in Ephesians 4, God has given us all gifts so that we can build each other up and so that we can grow in our, in our uh, maturity as well. And they're all parts of the way God works in his people so that we can become one body. He has gifted you with some form of ministry, whether it's kids' church, music, youth ministry, uh, welcoming, food, um, whether it's hospitality, whether it's, it's compassion, gifts of grace, uh, in any sort of area, setting up um, just your ability to put things together. Uh, please, if, you, if you're not involved in a, in a ministry in our church and you consider yourself a congregation member, Please ask yourself where you, where you can be able to volunteer for our ministry and right that wrong as well. And in your area of giving, in your treasures, um, uh, if, please hear this. If, you, if you're a guest and you're not part of our congregation or you're still trying to work out whether you're connect, you want to be connected to Christchurch, please, please uh, don't hear this um, as any pressure on you. Or, or, please don't feel the burden of this point. But if you are a committed member and you've made a decision to be part of our church, Please write that wrong as well. Uh, make a commitment to God with your treasures, with your giving, that you put aside a sum of money there first before everything else. That's the right way to do it. And so the fear of the Lord, brothers and sisters, drives you to obedience in God. And I promise, it's a guarantee that through that obedience, you will understand the joy of the Lord. And I think it works a little bit like like this. I'm sure at times when my children uh, have done wrong and I, and I begin to grizzle or I begin to get angry, you know, there's a sense of fear that they experience, especially the boys. They're only seven years old and they've told me, Dad, whenever you raise your voice, we get really scared. Uh, and I just say, look, I'm sorry, but sometimes I get angry. And when you do the wrong thing or you, you stray or, you know, Dad gets angry. But let me tell you how, it's a funny thing how they will jump into your arms as a safe haven, the very moment they realise uh, that they're frightened by something else externally. For some reason, they connect that the protection of dad, uh, which is shown at times in, in you know, justice and anger and all those sort of things, is somehow greater than that external thing that's threatening them at the time. And I see Tyson and Aidan at times when they're asleep and they're, they're snuggled in my arms. There is a peace there. There is a, there's a serenity. There's a, a comfort. Um, a, they're not fearful of me. They actually feel protected. And their sleep uh, is just so serene. It's beautiful. 
And a man of woman or God, brothers and sisters, who lives in the fear of the Lord has learned just that. They know the greatness of God. They know his justice. They know his destructive power and righteousness. But they know that that is greater than any other power. And that's why they feel protected, galvanised, uh, that they will endure, that there is hope and eternal glory for them. And therefore they can experience a deep and an unwavering joy for all is good with our souls. And when all is good with our souls, brothers and sisters, therefore all is good. And that's the joy of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, I do pray that uh, as we look at Nehemiah and, and how he leads his people, Father, we will see a man who in the first instance is a man who fears the Lord, who, who his desire is to obey him. And through his obedience, he can declare in chapter 8, verse 10, uh, be strengthened in the, fear, uh, in the joy of the Lord. So, Father, Lord, I pray that we can tap into that that regardless of our circumstances and what's, what's around us today, uh, we can say with, with such fervour and excitement and enjoyment, Lord, uh, that the Lord is good uh, and you are good to us uh, so that we may continue to live in the joy of the Lord. Amen.